You remember I arrived in this town on a, vid on a business venture. It was a proxy row for control of what was then a little company in this town. The fight fell through. My associates were have become lately variety. All my old friends in Wall Street were gone. So they also went. I was left in the Mayflower Hotel with 10 bucks in my pocket. Prior to this, I had worked very hard back home with grunts, uh, you know, Oxford Group people. Uh, had a mission. We worked there. Worked at Towns Hospital where my doctor was. Absolutely no result. And looking back, I see that I was still preaching to people. But all of a sudden, in the lobby of the hotel down there, I had my first temptation to drink since sobering up. And it suddenly dawned upon me that I might, while I was, had been granted by God a rebirth, it had been the effort to help others that had kept me sober. So I suddenly knew that if I were to stay sober, I needed to find another alcoholic in this town. So I looked down the church directory. There was a name, Walter Tunk, who turned out to be the Episcopal rector here. It was a little odd sounding and uh, whimsically I picked it out. Providentially, I think, too. And this good man directed me to another, a member of the Oxford groups here at the time, and he, in turn, gave me a list of about ten names. And uh, I began to call them up. Well, it was a weekend. I couldn't make any immediate dates for that day. Somebody I had to see right then. At the end of the list was the name Henrietta Steinbrenner. And I thought, well, gracious, I, I met the old gentleman one time, and I can't possibly go out to this lady's home telling her I'm looking for a drunk to work on. This will never do. I walked up and down that lobby again, and a voice came saying, you had better make that call. I went upstairs and made the call, and here was Henrietta's delightful southern voice on the wire. And she said, I'm no drinker, but I think I understand. Won't you come straight out here? How much we owe our friends. And to a stranger, she said this. So out I went. Said she, I think I know just the man. It's Dr. Bob. He and his wife, Anne, are in a terrible situation. He's desperately trying to get over his drink. I'll call them up. She did. Anne's voice came on the wire. She said, Anne, it's the day before Mother's Day, you know, Henrietta. And Dr. Bob has just come home. He has brought with him a potted plant. It's on the table, but he's on the floor, and I'm afraid he can't get up, so we won't be there today. So nothing daunted, Henrietta said, well, so what about tomorrow? Now she said, Bill, you come out here to dinner, and let's see. So on tomorrow, at five in the afternoon, Dr. Bob... And Anne stood in the door, and he did not look in the least like a founder. He was shaking like hell. <laughs> and he said, 
eyeing me. Uh, he said, you know, I can only stay a few minutes. I have an appointment. So by way of identification, I said, well, I know, Bob, uh, <laughs> no question, you're very thirsty, am I right? He was. Discreetly, Henrietta moved us into the little library. And we sat there and talked for hours. And right there, the whole character of what I had been doing back home changed. I thought to myself, I need this man as much as he needs me. And I so told him. Well, Dr. Bob in spiritual matters was far advanced on me. But as far as the drinking was concerned, it hadn't taken hold. Yet as a doctor, like so many, he had no idea that he was a sick man. And I acquainted him with that. Ann asked me to come over to the house and stay with them while I tried to carry on with this proxy jingle. Bob made one trip to Atlantic City, and it was hard for Ann to let him go, and sure enough, he came home boiled. There was a terrible dilemma. He had to sober up, uh, uh, he had to do a critical operation within two days or three. So around the clock, Annie and I tapered him down. And we took him shivering up to the city hospital. Handed him one bottle of beer and one goofball, and he went in to carve up this patient. Well, you can imagine how we felt as we sat outside in the car. After a while, he came out. He said, I'm going to take you folks home. I have some errands to do. Hours later, after a lot of worry on our part, he turned up. He had already started to make restitution to those he had harmed. And he never took a drink from that day on. And then he said, but working on other people is a big thing, isn't it? I'll call up the city hospital. Maybe they got some cases. He'd been on the staff, but I believe he'd been kicked off. He called up a nurse he knew. He said, there's a gent here from New York that uh, has been helping me, and uh, we'd like some drunks to work on. And the nurse said uh, with some asperity, well, Dr. Bob, I hope you bought this idea yourself. <laughs> He said, we've got a beaut. She did. Just came in here. He's in DT. He's strapped down. But before we got him strapped, he blacked the eyes of one of the nurses. He's been in here four times in the last six months. How's that? Bob said, that's a dandy. Here's the way to medicate him. We'll be down tomorrow. On the morrow, there was the man on the bed. We walked in, we told him the story, and he said, well, it's too late for me. But he says, won't you come back again? Yes, Bill, we'll come back again, we said. Next morning we came down. There was his wife, Henrietta, standing by the bed. Bill looked at us. Henrietta said, these are the fellows that understand. Now listen to what they have to say. So we went over it again. And Bill said, Henrietta, please fetch me my clothes. We're going home now. Bill never took another drink. And so God had wrought the first AA group in the world. And the magnificent sequel to this in this town you know. Bob's association with Sister Ignatia. She and he ministering to 5,000 cases in the ensuing 10 years from 1940 at St. Thomas. After his death, 
she ministering to another 10,000 cases. Indeed, I think it's altogether saying, proper to say, that these two were the prince and the princesses of 12 steps, and never will there be any more like them.